Hello everybody and welcome to Paragate After Hours. I am your host Joe. This is the podcast where we go ahead and talk about all things nerdy and nerdy type shit. Also, most likely gay shit mm-hmm. sometimes. Uh, actually, most of the time. All the time. Always. Anyway, so I am Joe. Uh, I run Paragate and I am joined again this week by my co-host, uh, Mayel. Hello. So, Mayel. Yes. Dear sweet Mayel. Yes. What have you been playing this week? Well, alongside drinking bullet whiskey, because that's the kind of bitches we are, yep. um, I have been addicted to Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. Oh, yeah. I, I've noticed, like, now that they finally got the update with the best boy, Bob, it's like, yes. obviously, it's a little bit unavoidable at this point. Yes. So, I have been playing Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. Every single day since it came out. I even um, switched my account at one point to um, Australian so that I could play the first release of uh, Animal Crossing when it was accidentally released. Um, But now I am playing it, um, the official version of it, um, and all of its glory. And I've got a lot of thoughts and opinions on it so i do want to ask a question though like Mm -hmm. have you dropped any money on this game like at all so technically no um i was gifted um our our family gifted us uh itunes gift cards (laughs) Um, and I don't really use iTunes, so, uh, I, I pretty much, uh, use, um, Google Play Music's streaming right. service, um, which is really good, and so I have no interest in buying, uh... Sponsored by Google. <laughs> fucking imagine. <laughs> Just imagine that sweet Google money, Joe. Oh, God, uh, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. No, so I... I had a $25 iTunes gift card, and I said originally that I was gonna buy a, a singular album... And then maybe do something else. That. No, I put that entire $25 into Animal Crossing. Really? I said I sunk all $25. I have not actually spent all $25 in with the in-game currency. Um, but you sunk, like, the equivalent of $25, which wasn't your $25. It wasn't my $25. So I felt, I felt like this was my opportunity to... Um, make use of what was at the time like the the bonus bundles like you could buy extra stuff for um for like 20 bucks you got a huge good deal on stuff yeah um and uh so i guess i will say as far as my thoughts and opinions on this being a nintendo game with microtransactions included um in most situations, I think everyone could get away with not spending any money at all on this game. Right. Um, I only spent that money, that $25, on this game because I was given it and I really didn't have any other outlet for that $25. It was just going to be wasting space, right. uh, burning hole in my Apple account. So... I felt perfectly fine dropping that $25, and I totally think that anyone who is interested in playing Animal Crossing Pocket Camp could very well play the game without dropping a single penny on this game. Yeah. Um, I think that it'd also be reasonable to say that uh, for the amount of fun that I've had playing this game, I could see... Five or ten dollars here and there to be a reasonable decision. Um, certainly, it just makes things go faster. Honestly, yeah. if you have the money, um, but it's not. It's not. It doesn't inhibit your gameplay not having leave tickets because you can actually acquire them um, pretty consistently and easily throughout the game just by completing quests and uh, completing challenges and participating in events. So as far as I'll say, uh, Animal Crossing Pocket Camp has a lot of events. Um, Pretty much every week there's something going on in the game, whether they're introducing new characters or they're introducing um, like the garden events or like, uh, you know, furniture events. Um, I personally don't much care for the garden events. Currently, the the second one that is currently going on is um, Lottie, who's really cute in her Lolita outfit. 
um, doing, like, a little Lolita event, and personally, I have no interest in it because I don't dress my character up in, uh, cute, cute girly stuff. Right. My character is my gender, so yes. I, I, I feel like there's not really in it for me, um, but it's definitely cute. Um, I love Lottie. I love the fact that she's a realtor slash interior designer mm. by day. Yeah. And that she clearly listens to baby metal <laughs> and, you know, just like, like on her weekends goes and, uh, visits, um, like Lolita meetups and stuff. She's right. real cute. Uh, but you know, I don't really much care for these garden events. I do think that they are a little bit more, uh, how would you say like it time consuming? Um, but the overall game is fun. It's not a full Animal Crossing experience. Yeah. But it is an enjoyable ride. And certainly if you are attached to certain characters like I am, like Bob, Anka, um, Mitzi, like, yeah. you know, all these cats that I have an adoration for, even yeah. though I'm allergic to cats, <laughs> um, I... I think it's fun when your favorite characters finally pop up in the game and you get to see them and you just, you get to hear their little, their little jingle and their you're just jingle. like, I, I'm here, I'm home, I'm <laughs> home, I'm with Bob. And then when you finally get like Bob's clothing, you're just like, yes, yes, I'm so happy right now. So would you say like this game is suitable or rather appropriately kind of scratching that itch until we finally get that nice switch um, Animal Crossing announcement. I would say, for me, it does. Mm. I think for a lot of people like you, uh, yeah. it doesn't quite scratch the itch. I would say that it's it's not necessarily for all Animal Crossing lovers, because I do know that everyone plays Animal Crossing differently. Yeah. Um, but the way that I play Animal Crossing... Um, I mean, I, I greatly enjoyed Happy Home Designers right. as a tech demo that it was. Um, so I think that... Uh, you know, I, I'm the kind of person who would be interested in Pocket Camp, and certain other people appreciate Animal Crossing for the fish collecting or, yeah. you know, um, real genuine interactions with, with the, the villagers, um, in which case they might not necessarily like Pocket Camp. But that's, that's my, uh, that's my take on this game. So, Joe, what, uh, what have you been playing? Well, so, what I've been playing, um is a couple of re-releases on the Switch. Um, which, the Switch has just become, like, this home for just a multitude of re-releases. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually been playing a game that came out on Steam, I want to say about a year ago, Hardened Slash. Um, and I've been playing this pretty frequently. Um, and I gotta say, with the port's quality, I'm not as enthused about it. Mm -hmm. So, I played on Steam on my PC um, about a year ago. And I loved that game. Um, there was a lot of things I really liked about it. It was a beat em up kind of like um, you know a platinum game, and it was roguelike. So it's like every time you every time you start a new run, it's like you know it's a randomized dungeon that you go ahead and go through. You collect upgrades, blah blah. blah. And I love the aesthetic too. Like the music is great. Um, you play as like a TV headed robot, which again I love. And it has a little hard on screen, so it's like my aesthetic. Yeah. Um, so I really liked this game, and it was a lot of fun. The problem was when I was playing it. It was still early access, so there were still kind of weird bugs. You would clip through the floor. Um, there was one particular part that would happen at, l like, the last level of the game where it's, like, suddenly the orbital elevator would just stop going up, so you would never reach the end of the stage. Rip. So I was thinking, like, okay, now that Hard and Slash is on the Switch, it's out of early access, a lot of these problems should be fixed. They're not. Um, the other thing I noticed was that when you get to the second dungeon, which is, like, a cityscape, the frame rate, like, I, I, you know, I try to be this person that's not, like, a stickler for frame rate unless it dips below, like, two frames per second, and it goes to two frames per second if you reach, like, a certain room in the cityscape, mm -hmm. where it's, like, too many things are going on around screen, and then all of a sudden it's, like, and it's, it's, it's bad. And they still didn't fix a lot of the issues with the last level. Like, I clipped through the floor, and I was stuck there, and I couldn't get out. So I had to restart my run, Ooh. get all of my... like, And that's just it. The equipment you get is also randomized, so you can't carry over equipment. Oh. So you're basically fucked if, like, you need to go ahead and do that. Yeah. 
So it was not fun, and I I enjoy the game, and I recommend it at like that kind of caveat of like it's a buggy mess. Mm-hmm. And I really hope like a heart full of games. I haven't seen them develop anything else yet. That if they're kind of listening still to fan feedback and all that stuff, like maybe they kind of take a deeper look at this game and just be like, listen, dudes, like really, it's been about two years now. You. you and you put this game out in two years, it's like, I think it's time you kind of make this a little bit better. Yeah. Um, would you say that you experience this um, rather frequently where uh, ports are, ports to the Switch are not perfect? Um, well, I can't really say, I can't really say yes. Because, like, um, a couple of the ports that I played, like um, Shovel Knight... Um, I played basically through the majority of Shuffle Knight. Like, it's been great and fantastic, but that's also Yacht Club Games, which is now kind of like a high standard now. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that, that Shovel Knight is, is high standard. No, but, um, you know, you played Doom on oh, the Doom. Switch. Oh, Doom. Yes. Okay, so Doom was optimized for the Switch in the best possible way. Um, I, I'm glad you reminded me about Doom. I was like, how could I forget this? Anyway, um, so Doom is optimized in the best kind of way where it's like, yeah, you know, the graphics take a significant downgrade because I played on PC. Yeah. Um, and the frame rate goes down to 30 frames per second instead of 60 frames. But the more you play it, the more you get used to it, the more it becomes unnoticeable. And that's the thing that I think ports need to do is that it makes this seamless transition of like, yeah, you played this game a year ago on a much more powerful rig, but now that's on a smaller screen, now that's on here, one, your brain kind of already, it says, like, it's on a smaller screen, it's not going to be as powerful, you know it's not going to be as powerful. Like, there's that logical reasoning there. But um, the other thing is, is, like, they are able to go ahead and make it so that it still encapsulates, like, the action of Doom. Like, that's just it. It's like, it doesn't interfere with gameplay. It still is fast. It still is, like, even though it's running at 30 frames per second, which is slower, it's still fast. Yeah. And that is something that I feel like a lot of developers and a lot of people who are porting to the Switch need to really accommodate for because, like, Hard and Slash is a very fast game on PC. Yeah. But then you put it to the Switch, and now all of a sudden it's not, and they didn't accommodate for the Switch's hardware. I just think about how Doom's port to Switch also had a few interesting bugs. Oh, yeah. Like music glitches and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but uh, the other thing I was thinking of was something that we were discussing today while we were in Target. Yeah. Um, many uh, ports to Switch, such as L.A. Noir, oh, yeah. uh, WWE 2018... Um, all have these special, like, labels on the front of the box, which are just real ugly looking, that says, uh, internet download and micro SD chip required. Um, and I, so the reason why they do that, right, is because, um, they basically, the game is not compressed enough to fit into a Switch cartridge. Right. So they have decided that you just have to download the rest of the game when you get home. And that bugs me. So part of it is, one, the developer's fault for not, you know, actively compressing this game. Another part of the problem is Nintendo itself. Yeah. Because, like, Nintendo does not, is not very forthcoming with a lot of, like, you know, its hardware specs. Um, there's a few companies that kind of get it mm -hmm. um, once they get the development kit, but then you also got to accommodate for the fact that like the um, Switch cartridges themselves are only about 32 gigabytes big, um, which again, yes, you should be better at you know compressing these games. Like Panic Button, who did the um, Doom port, was fantastic with this. Yeah, I was able to make it into about roughly 20 gigs. Yeah. Um, well, and I think that's the thing is that. Um... I feel like any of us, when we download a game from Steam right. uh, onto our computer and we see 50 gigabytes remaining, like, all of us just, <gasps> but why, though? You know, and I, I think that um, I, I my frustration with it was when you have games like Breath of the Wild right. and Mario Odyssey that are so expansive, so large, so polished, um, and just... There's so much crammed into these experiences, and yet 
they clearly can fit on the cartridge. And, and maybe this is first party versus third party development. Right. Uh, I just think that, you know, I find I find it a little bit frustrating that I don't think L.A. Noir is... L.A. Noir really doesn't deserve Yeah, that. L.A. Noir and w, uh, WWE 2K18 don't necessarily deserve 50 gigabytes of my memory. Let's be real. <laughs> so, like, with those particular games, like, especially L.A. Noir, which is a port of, like, a 2008 game or something... Come on, guys, we can compress that down to 20 gigabytes, I'm sure. I'm sure, and I, like... Because it made sense for me, like, why Dark Souls um, Remastered is coming out on the Switch. Yeah. Because it's the original Dark Souls. Yeah. And all you have to do is upscale. Yeah. So it's like, from there, it's like, you know, the Switch is a little bit better than PS3. So it's like, okay, make the textures a little bit more prettier. Give it a little bit more particle effects. And there you go. Yeah. Like, the, the one game that I would understand and is a large file on on the computer is uh, Metal Gear Solid Five. Yes. But also, there's so much stuff in that game that I'd be like, well, yeah, that's a 50 gigabyte download. I totally get it. So, fun fact. What? On my computer? Yeah. 20 gigs. Fucking! Look, okay. <laughs> Listen, game developers. If Metal Gear Solid Five can fit into 20 gigabytes, L.A. Noir can fit into 20 gigabytes, all right? Okay, I think we, we've covered our basis with that. I think that. we've covered our bases. So anyway, to kind of loop this back around to um, Harden Slash, Harden Slash, um, I like it, but it still has problems, and those problems really need to be addressed because it's been far too long for it to go unaddressed. Yeah, and especially when you are porting something, I think that that gives you more opportunities to do the debugging that they clearly didn't do. Honestly. Okay, so what else have you been playing? Um, so the other game that I wanted to talk about that I've been playing on and off between playthroughs of Ble Breath of the Wild, because that's the kind of bitch that I am, yeah. um, has been Snake Pass. Ooh. So Snake Pass is another game on the Switch. You guys are going to see a trend with this. Uh, we play Switch games. Uh, <laughs> we love Nintendo. We're I, Nintendo bitches. I mean, this is going to be hosted on Paragade, which I've already posted an article about, like, how much I love this fucking console. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I have my own, and I love it. I adore yep. it. Um. And so Snake Pass is this really fun game that is a platformer, but it takes away the core mechanic of a usual platform, the jumping. Oh. So Snake Pass is a game in which you are a snake, and you cannot jump because you are a snake. Um, instead, you must coil your way around throughout the levels. Um, and it is really... a uh, really well polished it's real pretty to look at it's real uh the levels are pretty basically built like there's not it's not like they kind of reuse assets level to level well, yeah but i mean i it's still pretty to look at it's still f each level really still feels fresh because they always bring something new uh some new mechanics uh into each level and and new and interesting puzzles and as i am the puzzle person uh I really get a good kick out of this. Right. It's it's all of the kind of puzzle elements that I enjoy of, say, something like a, a Zelda game. Yeah. With all of the platforming, I must collect everything itch that uh, I get from Banjo-Kazooie. Right. Um, so the one thing that I don't like about this game is the fucking bird. I hate the fucking bird companion. Whenever I watch you play that, I'm just thinking, Navi? Yeah, no, so that's the thing. Um, you would think that, okay, so obviously when you start this game, because this is such an interesting concept, there's got to be someone to explain to you how to do the things. I just, I understand that unlike with Breath of the Wild, where they could drop you in the middle of Hyrule and say, go do the thing, and pretty much everyone can figure out how to go do the thing. Right. Um introducing this weirdness into platformers everyone's used to platformers yes. jump run and jump but when you remove the jump i mean even most expert gamers are going to be like 
what do what do so obviously they had to have someone something an npc of some sort introduce the concept to you um and so that's where the bird comes in and the bird bird's whole job is to just sit there and point out and how to do things and i am now like at the level two stages and the bird is still pointing out things to me the bird will still stop my gameplay, cut the camera over here, and the bird will float around and make an annoying noise and go, look, over here, you gotta go do this thing. And I'm just like, stop. Go away, you fucking bitch. Like, I just, I hate, yeah. I absolutely hate it. It's, it is very much the Navi concept of, we clearly need to point out everything to you, otherwise you'll be lost. And maybe that's because the camera is also terrible in this game, but um, that's really my feelings about the bird. And also, the bird has another option that when you press a certain button um, as you're coiling around, you can have the bird pick up the tail end of you and basically launch you into space. Right. Um, and by launch you into space, I mean pretty much uncoil you from whatever you were sticking to and then drop you. Um, because the bird is absolutely worthless. I have died so many times because I accidentally clicked that button and the bird came whizzing down, grabbed my tail, and I lost all traction and fell into space while the bird just watched helplessly. Like, maybe you could get some muscles. Don't skip leg day, bird. So, from the sound of it, though, yeah, like, just from that whole, like, tirade, how would you say your overall feelings are towards this game? Um... I would say that this is a good game to kind of play, like, I play each level as I go. Like, I don't actually try to run it all the way through. Right, right. I like playing one level and then stopping right there. Yeah. I think that's, I think each level is a good amount of time yeah. to take away from something else or just to relax and unwind, um, <laughs> unwind, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, it, it's, it's, it is a moderately decent fun experience right but i would say that it can get very frustrating if you were to sit down with it for say more than an hour um but definitely a fun experience and i think that it would be interesting to see more of this platformer but removing this core essence of the right. platformer so i would say like um like a lot of the things that we were kind of talking about there like just for our viewers if this is a personal favorite of mine. Um, there's actually this um, channel called Game Maker's Toolkit, which also talks a lot about um, Snake Pass's gameplay mechanics. Yeah. Like, definitely go check that out. It's a really good uh, video and kind of one of the reasons why I picked up Snake Pass um, for Christmas. And, I mean, I definitely would say I'd give it, you know, some sort of rating around a 7 or an 8 out of 10. Right. Um, definitely there's issues with it. Um, issues that I typically find annoying. But if you're the type of person who doesn't care, who is the type of person who has Navi as your text, uh, notification because you're that awful <laughs> monster and I hate you, you'll probably like this totally fine and give it a 10 out of 10. Probably will yeah so the last game i've kind of been playing around with um just because it was like okay so i said it was 420 yeah it's actually 450 uh-huh um it's earth wars which is another port apparently um it came out on ps4 expo and steam it's about 20 dollars on like steam and shit yeah but for whatever reason it's just like eh, it'll be 450 on the switch so it took like a 75 percent like cut there um, and Earth Wars is, like, a side-scroller beat-em-up. Um, you might notice a trend. I like beat-em-ups. Um, so it's a side-scroller beat-em-up, which kind of looks like the style of, like, Dragon's Crown, which came out on the PS4, and I don't know if you know Dragon's Crown there, um, which is kind You might know it if you saw the big titty like, um, barbarian chick. And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, that one. So it kind of looks like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I showed you some gameplay footage. Yes, you did. And, like, I picked a girl avatar because it looked better than the male avatars, which were <laughs> way too buff and looked like just walking refrigerators. Like, like there's no neck. There's no neck. There, there is just more shoulder. But the girls look slightly better. They have sticks for legs and arms, but it, it, it's more... At least they had necks. 
at least they had necks and it made sense why they were using katanas. Mm -hmm. So it's really good. Mm -hmm. Um, the animation is very janky. It's very much like, you know, flash kind of like animation, which is like, you know, it's like, if you can deal with that, like I can great. Um, because the gameplay is actually very satisfying. So it has like this dodge mechanic, um, which is called like a boost. So you go ahead and like, you know, boost from one side of the screen to the other side. Kind of like how Hyper Light Drifter did like that chain boost. Yes. You can do that in this game. Oh, good. So it's really cool. And then from there, you can chain like combos. You can go ahead and do like a heavy attack, a light attack. And then you can also chain your gun, which then juggles like a character. So it's kind of like this weird Devil May Cry thing. Because like in Devil May Cry, like when you launch someone up, it would be like juggle, juggle, juggle. And then go ahead and go in for the kill. So it's really satisfying. And I have a lot of fun with it. Um, and it's really one of those good pick em, pick em up and play games. Um, there's a story I honestly skip all the cutscenes because I really don't care. Um, it's something about, like, um, an alien race came to evade Earth, and uh, I just, who cares? You're in it for the gameplay. Yeah, it really is just so gameplay-centric. Like, I find it so weird because it's like, um... Like, I rarely go into games so hard with just, you know, pure gameplay mechanics. But this one was just, like, it really grabbed me. One, because it was cheap. But two, because it turned out to be really good. Yeah. <laughs> and I really wasn't expecting that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it, like, the more I played it, and you kind of get to this point where it's like you can do extra missions and stuff. And that's kind of where I've cut off so far. And also, I am just going to say right now, this will be a little bit of a longer episode yeah i was noticing that just because um one um so just to kind of break the thing here we are no longer gonna be hosting on soundcloud uh because it turns out that soundcloud has like a sort of hard limit yeah so i'm gonna start hosting this on youtube so you might expect this to be a little bit of an hour long now hey so yeah anyway so going back to earth wars um i've been playing that a lot recently and it's really yeah so it's really good I really, really recommend it, especially at the price. Mm -hmm. Like, if you can get past the kind of Flash-style animation, it's really satisfying to play. Like, I, that's the thing, is that you're you're basically in it for the game mechanics. Oh, yeah. So, if this kind of beat-em-up is your uh, your niche, is that, if, that's, if that's your thing... And you need to you need to scratch that itch. This will scratch that itch for the price. Yep. So, um, we've talked about four games that we're currently playing, um... Yes. And things that we like. On, on the topic of things that we like, uh, we're gonna do some Podception here. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Podception, or Metacast. <laughs> uh, so, this is a podcast, and we obviously like podcasts. Yes. So, I think that we should... I We, we kind of had to do this uh, episode kind of impromptu, um, because Joe originally was going to be doing a podcast with Sky, our roommate. Our roommate, and also, like, if you follow Perrigate at all, um, we've done Dark Stout. Yes. Um, that has kind of shifted to this, which is now Paragate After Hours. Well, though you might you might return to Dark Stout. Might return to Dark Stout. But, uh, you know, I think that, um, yeah, basically, you and Sky were originally going to be doing a podcast, but Sky has come down with the flu. Which, don't worry, next week we're definitely going to be talking about Monster Hunter World. Yes. Like, that is a definite for sure thing. Yes. But so, anyway, podcastception. Yeah, so podcastception. I thought it'd be fun for us to talk about maybe two or three podcasts that we like, that we listen to, um, and so, you know, I figured that we could get started with something that both of us listen to. Yes. Uh, Warp World podcast. Oh, yeah. So another little small podcast, though they're already much larger than us. Um, <laughs> I know this for a fact. Uh, they are, um, they are, it's a really good podcast run by, uh, Twitch streamers and speedrunners, um, Grand Pooh Bear, X Water, and Jakku, um, and they are basically just do a regular gaming news podcast, right. but this is, I, I feel like with a lot of podcasts, there's always a very specific format that, oh, what? 
Do you want a refill? Mm, no. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take a little you, refill. Okay, so I'll, I'll explain. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll you, be right here. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of podcasts that... Um, you either you either like or you don't like. It's just whether or not you like that kind of style or you don't. And Warp World Podcast is basically just how I like my typical, you know, just people sitting around talking about things um, and usually interrupting each other because that's just what they do. But, uh, yeah, it, it's basically gaming news and a lot of it is very uh, speedrun centric. So if you're into speedrunning community or just uh, Twitch streaming in general, uh, it's good to have your, uh, your get to, to, you know, kind of keep up on, on what's going on in that sphere of, of gaming. Yeah, and a lot of things I do like about it is that it's very kind of informal. Um, just because it's like, you know, I listen to, like, you know, a couple of more professional podcasts. Oh, yeah, certainly I do too, but, yeah. you know, I, I, I can only handle so much of that. Right, exactly, and it's that nice little dosage of just kind of a little bit of informalness, um, and I do kind of like their opinions on, like, you know, just the gaming industry in general. Like, I remember in particular when they were talking about, like, um, Star Wars Battlefront 2, um, and just kind of, like, their take on that, and just, like, you know, they, they are one just relatable people just more so in the fact that like you know they're not that big so it's just like you know hey like we are regular people talking about regular things kind of yeah um, and, and also because they're another small podcast uh they aren't doing any sponsorships or right. any big commercials so it is very much it feels a lot more informal and just like you're just you're just getting your news while you're driving to work basically right and you're not you're not getting any fluff um, and I will say that it, even if you disagree with some of their opinions, uh, in general, you can still, like, agree to disagree, agree that you both have different opinions, but these, do but having different opinions does not affect who lives or dies, you know? Right. It's, you know, my, my opinions on disability and gaming, um, and, and accessibility, um, are much different than, say, you know, Grand Pooh Bears or right. Jack Hoos, but that doesn't mean that I have to hate them as people, you know? <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. You can probably cut that part. I might want to cut that part out. Yes. So, uh, you know, I really enjoy listening to them, and, uh, you know, I enjoy a lot of other podcasts, but it's very good for my, uh, Tuesday morning commute. So, Joe, what about you? So, for me, um, in particular, like, so, I'm just gonna, like, preface this right now. Mm-hmm. Um, just so we put it out there, I listen to McElroy's. So, I'm not gonna talk at length about McElroy's. I'm just gonna say, my brother, my brother, me, I laughed so much at Adventure Zone. I couldn't get through the balance arc, but I really like the mini arcs that they're doing right now. That's all I'm gonna say about them. Yeah, so, uh... For future reference, Joe is a Mibiban fan. I love it. And I am a... I am not. You're not, but you can at least appreciate some of the jokes that they I, have. I appreciate some of the jokes. I... I'm not I'm not a big fan of the overall Mibimban universe of content. Yes. Um, I'm not addicted to it like you are, no, no, and no. that's fine. Uh, but, it just means that a lot of times Joe makes terrible, terrible jokes that fall super flat with me, and I'm just like, can you please stop screaming Shrimp Heaven now in my face? Okay, thank you. No, that's not gonna happen. Shrimp yeah. Heaven now. Anyway, so instead, I'm gonna talk about another one of my favorite podcasts, 8 for Play. Um, so this is, um, actually headed by a translation company based out of, um, Japan, who goes ahead and translates, um, Japanese games, not just for Japan, but also for American audiences. And it's, um, headed up by a couple of these workers there. Um, some of them are also not workers. Um, they just come in for the podcast. Um, anyway, I'm giving it a really bad <laughs> sort of, like, synopsis here. But the point is, the people behind, um, the Japanese release of Undertale, um... Yes. Are also responsible for a podcast. Yes. So if you ever want to know about how translators deal with certain games or you well, know just their their gaming news. Yeah. So basically, it's about um, Japanese games and you know Japanese culture, um, and also just like you know kind of like those sorts of news. Um, they've 
you know, they also talk about some more universal gaming news, things like Destiny, PUBG. It's like, you know, shit that just goes ahead and takes the world by storm. Yeah. But I think from the perspective of a translator, it's right. a very interesting perspective. It's um, a very interesting perspective. thing. Yeah, because they're, like, because they're based out of Japan, and it's a lot of Americans who go ahead and, like, join this company. Um, and they're based, like, you know, their whole perspective is, like, you know, they're, like, entrenched in Japanese gaming culture. Like, that is their shtick. Like, that is what they consume, that's what they're most, like, you know, um, exposed to, and that's kind of, like, how they address a lot of these games. So it's, like, every once in a while they talk about, like, Destiny, or talk about PUBG, and it's just so weird to kind of hear, like, these kind of people's, like, perspective on that. Yeah. Because, like, you know, one, um, so... Um, I don't know if you know this, but, um, if you win a game of PUBG, um, in America, it's called Winner Winner Chicken Dinner. In, um, Japan, it's actually called a Katsudan. A Katsudan. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Which, so, Katsudan is fried cutlet bowl. Exactly. So, it's actually called that in Japan. So, like, it, they talk about, like, these regional differences. They talk about, like, you know, these things that, like, happen within gaming. Well, actually, I feel like Katsudan is, um, pretty much the, the... The direct comparison to Winner Winner Chicken Dinner. Oh, yeah, definitely. No one's saying grilled chicken. Everyone's talking about, like, obviously, Winner Winner Chicken Dinner is fried chicken. It's obviously gotta be fried chicken. Exactly. So, like, they talk about this, and they talk about, like, those kind of, like, you know, con like, these regional differences that happen within gaming, and it's so nifty to hear that, and then I've learned about so many games mm -hmm. that I've just never heard of, like, Weiss, they talk about Weiss, and I was like oh my god, like, I didn't know that this was this type of game. Or, like, they talk about, like, um, Earth Defense Force, and I'm like, okay. And they talk about, like, Disaster Report, and I'm just like, this sounds like the type of game I want to play. So, like, they talk about a lot of things that, like, I never realized I had much of an interest in, or that didn't really appeal to me as much. Um, especially, like, Dragon Quest. Like, they talk in length about Dragon Quest, and talk about the latest one, and I'm just like, this is so fucking cool. Which is really interesting, I think, for us because in America, Dragon Quest is very, very niche. Oh, yeah. Um, and so to really get the perspective of Dragon Quest in Japan yeah. and how it really is over there is really cool because it's just so different from here. I mean, that is the supreme game in Japan. Or when they talk about Monster Hunter. Yeah. And, like, I realize that Monster Hunter has completely taken off here because Monster Hunter World is such a superb game. Yeah, well, I feel like Monster Hunter for a while was as niche as Dragon oh, Quest. Oh, yes, it was so niche. Um, Because I never heard of it until I met you. Exactly, and it's just, like... With Dragon Quest, and they are talking about, like, these regional differences there, and also, like, even the regional differences with, like, Splatoon, like, how it's so big over there, and it actually eclipsed, um, Monster Hunter sales. Which is An huge. undertaking. So, um, it's really interesting, and I really, really recommend this podcast. Um, it's also affiliated with Giant Bomb, which, I mean, I don't know much about Giant Bomb, but I know it. I, I guess that might turn some people off. Um, but that's kind of one of the things to kind of, like, take into consideration. Um, again, I don't know anything about Giant Bomb. I don't know why I'm mentioning that. But anyway, um, A4 Play, go listen to them. They're 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 really good. Um, so anyway, since we're reaching about the 40-minute mark there, um, and we already talked about our podcast, let's go ahead and discuss news. So first, we're going to start with... Um, Octopath Traveler. All right. All right. So Octopath Traveler, like they released a demo, what, like uh, September? Yes. Yes. Um, so I released a demo back in September, and it's made by the same people who did Bravely Default. Um, and it's a turn-based RPG, and they released it on the Switch. And I played the demo. Did you get a chance to play the demo yet? Um, no, I downloaded it and then looked at it once, like, I, I looked at the icon and then went right back to playing Breath of the Wild, <laughs> which is pretty much how I play my Switch, is I'm like, hmm, am I going to play this game or Breath of the Wild? Let's go. You know? So, um, with this game, um, because I actually played both of the stories in that game, um, I didn't provide feedback because I'm an awful, awful person. 
You're lazy is what you are. I'm lazy. But anyway, um, so I didn't play much of Bravely Default or Bravely Second, mm -hmm. so I can't really speak about those games, but I really like the feel of this game. So the main thing that I like about it is the gameplay mechanic. So it's a turn-based RPG. So you go ahead and go into the um, battles. It's random battles, and it's a pixelated art style. Um, but certain enemies are weak to a certain type of attack or element. Mm -hmm. So if you attack them enough with that element, it breaks them, and it means that they lose a turn. So during that turn, you can basically attack them twice. And what you do is, like, you also have this burst mechanic where it goes ahead and, like, chains attacks. So in one turn, you can attack, like, five times. <sighs> and that basically takes down their defense and then breaks them. So you can do this to basically do, like, an infinite combo. Wow. And it's pretty interesting, and I really like that mechanic. Um, so it relates to kind of the news that um, happened recently is that when they were doing this, they were asking for feedback. And they recently put out a video which said that they were addressing a lot of this feedback and explaining how they were addressing that feedback. Which, let's be real, how many game developers really do that? Um... Well, technically, Blizzard does release, um, you know, videos in which they say, we've heard a lot of feedback, and we're not doing that. Instead, we're going to nerf Mercy. So, okay, <laughs> let me let me fix that. Yeah. How many game developers that aren't multiplayer um, game developers actually do this? Absolutely none. So that's the thing. I was just going to make a joke that Blizzard <laughs> is the only one that actually makes any videos explaining uh updates and usually they're to everyone's disappointment um i don't know of any developer that puts out real video updates or any kind of more than just patch right. notes explaining his patch notes are just like we did this and yeah. then it's like but why and you get no answer um but there's definitely no no video uh from any other developer that i've seen where they they do that and they're actually listening to user feedback right and the other thing that i find particularly great about this is that like one it came from a demo it didn't come from an early access you didn't have to buy this game it's not like you know you're buying in to be a qa tester basically yeah you just become a qa tester you become a qa tester for free yeah and i really think like a lot of companies could learn from this because it really does, like, one, it's, like, putting up that video, like, has apparently, like, lifted a lot of Square Enix fans' trust. Because they're like, you're listening to our feedback? What? Two, it was free? <laughs> yeah. So, like, it's one of those things where it's, like, I understand, like, a lot of indie developers do this because they don't have a lot of money to begin with. And, like, ah, pay into us and go ahead and get this done. But also, this is coming from basically, like, an indie developer in Japan. Yeah, well, I would say that they're they're so they are a part of Square Enix, right? But they are not the main. Uh, no. they're not the main Square Enix team. Yeah. So probably I would say not quite indie, but also not quite super funded, not right. AAA funded. Um, they are probably funded at like the bare minimum. The yeah, the bare minimum, and so you know. They don't have a whole team of QA testers. They probably have one guy. And so, yeah. you know, and, and really, you're not even really QA testing in the terms of, like, you are going through and making these things and figuring out what's going wrong. You're basically just finding something wrong and reporting it if you want to. But even then, you don't have to. You can right. still just play the demo and enjoy it. Yeah. So, overall, like, this news was particularly great. Um... And it was really great to see, like, you know, a lot of people being happy that, like, you know, their voices were being heard. And it's probably not going to make that many waves just because it's, like, you know, it's for JRPG. The, this is this is not a thing that people are going to be uh, repeating. You know, you right. don't, you, I, I, like, you'd love to see the I, game, com game companies around the world being like, wow, we should do that too. But let's be real. That's more of a... Um, that, that's, that's just 
being nice. Right. And we don't expect our game companies to be nice. We don't. And we should. <laughs> be, well, because we have game we have game developers like EA. We'll get to them in a second. <laughs> but anyway. I was, I was trying to make a... A good segue. I, I made a great segue. Actually, yeah, you did make a great segue. All right. Redo. <laughs> We're going to keep this in because I love this, but redo. So you're saying EA is the devil? EA might be the devil? Yeah. I don't know. According to many sources, EA is the worst. EA. So, so why is EA the worst in this week's news? Oh Joe? my goodness, dude. Okay, so you know Star Wars. I yeah. know Star Wars. Yeah. Um, you know Star Wars. Y- yeah. The multi-billion dollar fucking property. Yeah. That if you slap Star Wars on a pack of oranges, it will sell. Yeah. They somehow managed to fuck up a Star Wars game. They really did. And so they missed their goal for investors um, to sell 10 million units by now. Yes. Instead, they sold 9 million units. Oh. Oh, it's so small. Oh. Oh. So, so Joe, why, why did they miss that goal? Oh. And why, why do you think they missed that goal? And why does EA think they missed that goal? So, let me start with why I think they missed that goal. Um, one is... The news of them basically running a Star Wars themed gambling ring uh, got to enough of parents' ears that were probably going to buy Star Wars Battlefront 2 for their child. Uh, and then suddenly these parents worried that, like, what if little Timmy gets a hold of my credit card? And they were like, no, I'm not going to buy this for little Timmy for Christmas. Um, EA thinks that because of said mom thinking rationally and thinking like you know maybe my child shouldn't get into gambling is the problem and i just i I can't well so so the way i see it is and and the way it went down is gamers were rightfully so pissed off that it cost a shit ton of money to be good at the game Yes. Not not to get fun skins. To to win the game. Yes. They had to pay money. Pay extra money on top of a sixty dollar title. Um probably over hundreds of dollars. Over hundreds of dollars. And so as as capitalist society has directed, the consumers were angry and voiced their anger and because of that, Blizzard did not get as many buyers. Yes. They were not able to implement the microtransactions for a good chunk of time. Yep. And they lost a lot of money. And, and they are angry about that. And they are specifically upset with their consumers. They are so upset with us. And and that's the thing, is that what this comes down to is EA is angry that the consumers failed them. And and that's why they missed their 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 goal. Which, and, and that's really what this news comes down to. And you know, should we should we talk about why that doesn't work out? So not only like, you know, does voicing their discontent with the consumer like some disappointed dad like like they're thinking like you know oh if we say we're disappointed in them they're gonna go ahead and try to make it up to us like fucking no like first off i didn't need to buy your shit second now i really don't want to buy your shit yeah so so this is so the way that capitalism actually literally works is the power is in the consumers and the consumers' money. The power, the, the, the consumers have buying power, which means that where they put their money in, and what they want out of the market is what the market should give them. Right. The market should cater to the consumers, not the other way around. Right. Um, and that that's the core fundamental of capitalism. Yes. So EA is part of the market and made something that the consumers did not like 
Mm-hmm. The consumers voiced their complaints, and as a result, with their buying power, bought other games, or just in essence, did not buy EA's game. Right. EA does not have the power to say, we're angry that you didn't buy our game, because you literally made something that the consumers did not want, yep. and we voiced the fact that we did not want that. And, and no matter what, how many focus groups you used of very specific demographics, um, the consumers don't want the thing. They don't. If they don't want the thing, they are not going to put their money towards the thing. And how can you be angry at the consumers who actually have the power in this situation? And in fact, like you said, saying these kinds of things and and, and saying that they did not meet their goal because the consumers fucked up is basically asking for the mar- the consumers to be like, well, fuck you, I'm not going to buy any more of your products. Right. I mean, after this, and after the disappointments that was uh, Mass Effect Andromeda, yeah. and all of the other disappointments that EA has dished out time and time again, um, they are losing traction, um, at least with uh, the in-the-know gamers. And just over time, they are going to just lose more and more people and battlefront 2 was a prime example of that it really was and the whole thing is is like even with the in the know gamers like a lot of these in the know gamers are doing things like we're doing which is like you know hosting podcasts making youtube videos going ahead and doing these things reaching to a far wider audience that it's like yeah when they start reporting on the shit like you know ea being like you know we're disappointed that you didn't buy our shit and then everybody else is gonna be like fuck <laughs> yeah no and certainly we know gamers like we do personally know oh, yeah. gamers who are still going to buy these things regardless right. um you know one of your co-workers and yeah, one of my co- which know. he did get a refund oh good yeah good. he got his refund yeah but you know there's certainly a lot of gamers who are gonna buy into this anyway but the fact of the matter is is that buying power and the power of capitalist culture lies within the consumer and it is the consumer's responsibility to not put their money in egregious, egregious... Greed? Greed, yes. Yes. By, by, you know, these companies. And we're doing that. We literally did just that. Yep. I think the sales of Andromeda and the sales of Battlefront 2 should be indicators to EA. Yep. That... Yeah, certainly there's going to be 9 million people who don't care, but they're not getting their 10 million goal. They're not getting their 10 million goal, which is what investors want. And if investors are not getting what they want, because they are the secondary power in this situation, yes. and in, in late capitalism, stockholders um, have the secondary power, and if consumers aren't giving their power, and stockholders are dissuaded from giving their power, EA has to eventually back down from this shit. Or just fucking sink. Yep. So, that then brings me to, um, this third piece of news. Which, um, actually just came up because I just remembered it. Mm Mm-hmm. So, you know Bioware. Yes. I know Bioware. Yes. Bioware was one of my favorite companies. Bioware was also one of my favorite companies. So, so Joe is a Mass Effect fan, I love, and yeah. I am a Dragon Age fan. So, anyway, um, and we're gonna cl- kind of close out with this story. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know their game, um, the new game, which is Andromeda, not Andromeda. Um, yes. it's the newest one. That's the Iron Man armor. Huh. Fuck. Uh, what was it called? Uh, it was something really generic. Uh. <laughs> I'm gonna edit this out because this is bad. Um, I don't even remember. Anthem. Them. Oh yes. So Anthem. Yes. Uh, fucking Destiny Iron Man. Okay. Um. So you remember that horrible gameplay footage that was really, really like staged? It was just like you know, oh, we're gonna go hunt this monster, blah blah blah, and like that really bad staged, like you know, kind of uh, gameplay discussion. Yeah. So it turns out, um, one. Casey Hudson, um, the original producer for Mass Effect, actually came back to this game specifically. But a lot of um, 
Bioware sort of employees have come out anonymously to outlets like Kotaku and Polygon to basically say, this is our make or break situation. We've literally like taken from teams from Andromeda and from Dragon Age to play on this game because if we don't break like the goals for this game, we're, we're under. Yeah. Yeah. So this is something that I think a lot of gamers, especially Bioware fans, have already known. Um, Inquisition was a good game. I would not say a great game, but it was a good game. Um, and from there, I think during the production of Andromeda, we saw a lot of Mass Effect um, developers leave the company and say on Twitter, quote, we left it in good hands and move on, um, as well as um, the writers and developers of Dragon Age also say sayonara. Um, last year in particular and the year before, we had we saw several, uh, you know, uh, major figures right. at Bioware leave. Yeah. Um, and this also is just the typical curse of EA. This disaster of a company always seems to close the doors of these smaller companies that they keep on buying up. Yeah. Uh, Bioware would just be met, would just be one in many that have shuttered its doors as a result of being bought up by EA and over the course of several years. Um, and so I think a lot of Bioware fans knew that the day was coming that they would see the closure of their favorite studio. Um, and so the fact that they announced that this that this game is going to be their make or break and not even not even a mainstay title like Mass Effect or Dragon Age. It's a new um, IP. It's a new IP. Um, that, that part's more surprising, but I, I think that in... In general, Bioware fans really shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be. Like, the signs have always been there. We really aren't. Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not surprised. Um, when I learned that David Gator left yeah. um, Bioware, I was really heartbroken because he is an amazing, amazing writer. Um, he really made Dragon Age Inquisition... Um, as the, inclusive as it was. The the experience, yeah, and the experience for me um, was because of his writing and because of how touching the character stories were, especially right. with Dorian and Sarah, um, you know, and being what they were. And Krem, yeah. yeah. His inclusion of LGBTQ characters really um, touched me in a way, and I think touched a lot of Bioware fans in a way that we weren't expecting from this game. And right. it really made the game what it was. It really, it really, for a lot of us, made it, it covered up some of the flaws that we had with, say, the gameplay and whatnot because we were just so in love with the characters yeah. and the story. And so when I learned that he had left, I knew that. I wasn't going to be getting the sequel to Dragon Age that I was going to be expecting. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised if we never see a Dragon Age Inquisition, you know, Dragon Age game ever again. Um, because this this game that they are presenting to us, this, this new IP, which already, as you know, is a gamble. New IPs are, are always, always gonna, a gamble. Yeah, yeah. new IPs are always going to be a gamble. That's why it was huge news when Nintendo came out with Splatoon, because that yeah. was the first new IP in Forever. almost almost a decade. Yeah. Um. You know, I think their their newest IP since then might was have been Pikmin, Pikmin yeah. or Chibi Robo. Yeah. Um, you know, and you can see where that goes. It's, you know, most companies don't come up with new IPs because no. they just don't sell like uh, an a already established IP does. And so the fact that they are gambling the entire company on a new IP is scary. And I wouldn't be surprised if EA introduces some microtransactions into the works that... Well, they've already discussed, like, you know, apparently they're focusing on more of the gameplay as a service, which has been, like, the biggest buzzword from EA. Which basically means nothing to me. Yeah, so um, So I basically, I'm already... In, so th this is the way it usually works, is that um, Bioware does what they do, and then EA says, says, 
hey, put a microtransaction in there. Um, and so I'm, I'm not surprised if this is the end of Bioware. They are, they are trying their hardest and, I, you know, we, we can all kind of see that, like, they're desperate for this to work out. Oh, but they are. With, with EA as it is, and it doesn't sound like EA is going to be learning any lessons from, from Battlefront 2, this might be the last, the last huzzah. This might be the swan song. It might be. And... Hopefully it's like Metal Gear Solid Five, where it was actually really fucking good. Yeah. No, I I would be yeah. I would be content if this game was the swan song, but was was a good swan song. I think I think you can agree with me that Metal Gear Solid Five was like up until like the seventy five percent mark a great swan song. And then you beat Skullface. Yeah, it, yeah. it could have been so much better, and there could have been so much more that yeah. Kojima was able to add. Um, but with what we were given, I it think... It was really good. I think we were given a gift with that game. Yeah, we were. It, it was a game that was never meant to exist, and it still exists. Yeah, and, and so I, I guess what I am hoping for is, if nothing else, that's what we get out of Bioware. I hope so, too. Because I, I just don't expect this to be what they're hoping it to be. And you know what? I want to be wrong on that. I hope, so. like... Like, I want to be wrong. Yeah. But I'm tempering my expectations. Same. So, with that being said, um, that kind of closes out this episode of Paragate After Hours. Yeah. Um, so, M. Yes. Where can people find you? Um, at Myel Ecology on YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter, eventually. Okay. And for me, um, you can find me at just Joe Stars on Twitch. Um, you can find me at just Joe Let's Play on Twitter, and then of course you can find me on Paragade, where I sometimes write articles and also go ahead and post this podcast up on. Um, and of course you can find me on the Paragade video channel for YouTube. Um, and one last place I think I'm forgetting. No, I think that's about it. But um, also, just um, because I failed to mention in the first two episodes. Um, the intro and outro song is um, Yellow Sunlight Overdrive by the band Triath, um, Triforth. Um, you'll see in the description, but there are really good Japanese um, jazz band that goes ahead and makes really, really pumping and awesome songs in Jap jazz. Japanese jazz bands are the best. They're really good. I, as someone who is a jazz aficionado, I feel like... 10 out of 10. Japanese jazz knows what's up. Yeah, so, um, obviously check them out. Um, I would love if, like, for some reason or another I got in contact with them and I was just like, hey, can I use your song as, like, an intro for my podcast? And they're like, oh yeah, totally. I'd be like, fuck yeah. So, hopefully when this gets a copyright strike on YouTube, I can get, I can get to contact them and be like, hey, give me the rights to use your song. Anyway. Anyway. Um, so that about does it, and as always, in Paragates After Hours fashion, always remember to tip your wave. Always remember to tip your waiters 50%. 50% is still a lot, Joe. Always remember to tip your waiters 50%. Don't do that. Do it. Bye.